Good morning to all of them. This is a very fun day for us each year when we do our honoree. Uh, Lee, you're going to join um, a distinguished crowd of past honorees, including uh, Paul and Phyllis Fireman, uh, Jack and Barbara and Nicholas, uh, your friend Bobby Orr. I know Jack Nicholas is your friend too. Uh, Roger Clemens last year. So um, we're very proud to have you here. We look forward to a great event. We know it will be very unscripted and entertaining and, uh, and probably informative as well. Um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to Casey Sherman, who's going to moderate today and be the host. Uh, Casey is also a little bit member. He's kind of the hottest hand in Hollywood these days with his books and his movies and everything else. And we're uh, so proud of him as a person, and we're so proud of you uh, watching your career uh, kind of skyrocket like it has been. Uh, Casey and Lee have a history together, uh, which they'll probably get into. I'll let uh, Casey tell that story uh, during uh, the, the session today, because uh, Casey can tell stories like no one else. Uh, so we'll leave that, leave that to you. I'd like to start the program. Uh, we're lucky today, sometimes when we do uh, introductions of people, I have to read up on them and learn and, and do things like that. Uh, today, uh, one of my uh, longtime dear friends is with us. He is also a Willoughby member and a Willoughby resident. He happened to be Lee's partner, his uh, law partner for 25 years. Uh, so the stories they could go through could straighten all of our hair. Um, <laughs> but he, he won't say, he won't tell many of those today and he'll, he'll keep it clean. But uh, uh, Ken Fishman, the, who's now a judge, the Honorable Kenneth J. Fishman, uh, again, is a dear friend. We, we couldn't have a better uh, introduction uh, to Lee than Ken. So Ken, take it away. The worse the crime, the more reprehensible the defendant, and the more public the case, the more important the skills and commitment of his or her attorney. And that's because the greatest test of our criminal justice system arises in such situation where there's a temptation based on the accusations alone and the news that's reporting uh, about it to say, why waste the time and expense of a trial? The defendant must be guilty. Let's hang him. Imagine, however, if it were you, your son, your daughter, your spouse, your parent, your brother, your sister, or your best friend who <laughs> stood accused. My bet is that you would like to have F. Lee Bailey in your corner. Now, Lee was the undisputed guru of trial lawyers, having changed the profession by showing by example the impact of meticulous uh, pretrial investigation and preparation, by displaying the benefits of a fine-tuned memory and an artistic command of the English language, and by lifting the art of cross-examination uh, to new heights. He was the master of knowing how to obtain a balance in the media coverage of his highly publicized cases, not for self-aggrandizement, as some suspect, but rather to try to create a more fair environment from which jurors could be selected and where public attitudes might infest the judicial process. Well, I'm not normally nervous to be up in front of a crowd of any size. Tonight, it's a little different. As uh, uh, Ken so eloquently uh, talked about, as, as did David as well, tonight we are honoring uh, a legal legend, the 2018 Willow Bend honoree, F. Lee Bailey, Francis Lee Bailey. One more round of applause for Mr. Bailey. Thumbs up. All right, we're off to a good start here. Uh, as we all know, he's one of the most celebrated attorneys in American history. And if you Google the most celebrated attorneys in American history, they usually come up with a top 10 list. And unfortunately, the first person that we see on that list is Hillary Clinton. And the next person is Bill Clinton. And I'm going down the list. I'm waiting to see my friend Lee. And then he pops up right next to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Johnny Cochran's on that list, too. We'll get to him in a little while. I uh, would like to start off a little bit with some of the biographical information uh, of Lee's fascinating life. Here's a, a man that grew up, born in Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, was a, a brilliant student, had attended Harvard University, and suddenly he decided to give it all up and serve his country in the Korean War. 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Lee? Well, I mean, that sounds heroic, but my grades were, in fact, lousy, and the draft board <laughs> was breathing down my neck. Korea was a bad place to fight. You normally would freeze to death before they shot you. And I said, I might as well be a fighter pilot, because either they come back or they don't. And that transition into your legal career, how? Well, I don't like to be seamy, but <clears throat> we had an airplane blowing up on takeoff. One day, the first assistant legal officer of the squadron blew up on takeoff, and there was no, no chance when that happened. Um, the assistant's, the legal officer's wife said, you see those wings? These wings. You take them off now, or I'm getting out of here. They called me in the front office. They said, you're the legal officer. I said, what the hell are you talking about? I haven't finished college. I don't like lawyers. <laughs> um, why pick me? Because our volunteers are alphabetical. Your name begins B-A-A. I said, B-S, Colonel. I said, haven't you got something in OBGYN? He said, no, it's closed down. So um, he handed me a book and said, Tuesday, you're on trial. Read the book. And I did, and I was hooked. Talk about one of the cases that you uh, were involved in during that time. The military is still my idol as a tribunal, even though I have the good fortune to be associated in writing books still with the man I considered probably the best judge this state has ever generated and beyond. <clears throat> but the military worries a lot about wrongful convictions. Political prosecutors, not so much. We had a fellow who got convicted for assaulting a senior non-commissioned officer in a bar. We had a witness in Japan who couldn't be called in for the trial who saw the accuser provoke it. Accuser was white, we were in North Carolina, defendant was black. They hooked him. I went to see the colonel and I said, we've got to turn this around. He got the witness on the phone <clears throat> confirmed what I'd said and threw the case out. That was the high spot. It seems to be a running narrative in your career with that. Um, for military jurisprudence, I think the rest of us here, we've seen a few good men. Some of us remember the, the, the Kane Mutiny, um, Humphrey Bogart with his strawberries. Yep. Uh, well, how uh, separated was fact to fiction? Um, the military once had a, a, a slogan foisted off on it that military justice is to justice like military music is to music. And of course, you think of John Philip Sousa and a bunch of big drums. Uh, it's not so. It's the best system. I'm proud of the four years I spent there. It turned my life in several ways. I learned what Yogi Berra meant when he said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. And uh, I learned how to kick ass and take names and look after people. And that's how you begin to grow. In my book, when you're a 19-year-old, a hotshot jet jockey who keeps trying to kill himself every day by doing foolish things. <laughs> Live through that, the judgment gets better. <laughs> after Korea, it's uh, on to Boston University, uh, my alma mater as well. Um, Talk a little bit about your experience as a BU law student. Well, just before my time was up, um, they called me in. I had scored well up on one of the tests. Uh -huh. They said, we'd like to invite you to become regular. We were all reserved. And uh, I said, no, I've got to get out and go to law school. It's in my blood now. And so they offered me a very high paying civilian job affiliated with the military, really the CIA. And I turned that down, too, and found out that the guy who took my position was Francis Gary Powers. Why, well, you too. So it isn't the luck of the Irish, because I'm German and English, but I'll take it. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your, your, your time as a, a BU student. You're fresh out of the war. You're, uh, you, you found that, that niche, that passion that you said you had uh, and still do have for the law. You know, I must say, BU had little to do with it, more does any law school, because they don't teach 
trial law. They don't have the means or the people. The people are in court, not teaching. And I was forewarned of that. I had tried a lot of cases in the military. I knew some of the tricks the first year in law school. I was on full scholarship in GI Bill. I went to almost every class. A second year, not so much. <laughs> a third year, none. <laughs> the dean called me in. He said, you know, if you weren't the valedictorian, we'd throw you out. <laughs> So what was the first case that you handled fresh out of law school? Um, about six weeks by the bar, I get called in to do a small segment in a capital case in Cambridge with the defendant, like all defendants in those days charged with murder one, stood trial in an iron cage in the middle of the courtroom. Presumption of innocence just sticking out everywhere. Yeah. And his lawyer, who was 72, had mistakenly allowed into evidence a lie detector test, which he thought was innocuous. And the first one was, but the second one had a druggist who gave them free for the sheriff's department. He said the guy flunked a missing persons question. There was no murder at the time. I was brought in to school. The defense lawyer who had a heart attack as a result of his blunder. In about 30 minutes, he said, I can't do it, you do it. So I rearranged the gentleman's um, rear end for him. Uh, the jury acquitted. And after that, I got an awful lot of heavy criminal cases with no fee behind them <laughs> dumped in my lap. Just like my great and good friend, Joe Malero, who taught me everything I know except for what Kenny taught me when he came along. <laughs> Well, shortly thereafter that, you took on one of the most publicized cases in America at the time, the case of an Ohio doctor named Sam Shepard, who was accused of murdering his wife. That later inspired the television series, The Fugitive, and the movie, The Fugitive, as well. How did you become involved with that case, Lee? Same reason. I was uh, 28, one year by the bar, and I went looking for a lawyer that knew about the polygraph. Lawyers hated the polygraph on both sides because if they had to use only truthful witnesses, the dance would become a spin. And it was shackles they didn't want to put on. I loved it. I liked to know if my clients were telling me the truth. And if they weren't, I'd dig it out of them. It gave me a lot of winning cases because mm -hmm. lawyers who go to trial without knowing what their client knows get some very ugly surprises. And the Shepard family hired me for that. Eventually, just get him out. A lieutenant said to me, who was on the case originally, Sam had been in jail seven years. He said, if Sam Shepard is innocent, I don't want to know it. And I almost hit him. In the military, that would have been enough to start a real brawl. But we got him out. We got him acquitted in the second trial, and I had an edge like no lawyer has ever had before or since. Seven of the jurors at least watched The Fugitive, and everybody knew The Fugitive was innocent. <laughs> so cheers to uh, uh, David Jansen, correct? And Harrison Ford. And Harrison Ford. Oh, yeah. Well, we're, we're uh, sitting in front of a jury of uh, over 100 people tonight, so we're going to talk about a few of your uh, you know, major prominent cases like uh, the, uh, the Sam Shepard case, you seem to have uh, attracted some of the biggest uh, known cases in America at the time because you had the ability not only to uh, litigate these cases but also deal with the heavy media scrutiny that was happening at the time. How, how did you handle both sides of being a, a trial lawyer? Um, the press and I came to a kind of neutral ground. I either wouldn't tell them something or I'd tell them the truth, but not some BS. They gave me pretty good coverage, although they scored me repeatedly, because the press has a tendency to believe that news is best presented when something bad happens to someone. Good news is on the back page. Nobody reads it anyway. So we got along pretty well until the last case that the press took jurisdiction of. And then we butchered them, and they butchered us. 
whether this is urban legend or truth, there are stories about uh, you know Lee Bailey being announced in airports all over the country at the same time, even though Lee Bailey wasn't in any of the airports at the same time, just to get your, your name out there. Is that something that, that, that is true or false? It's absolute BS, and the six times I've been reported dead weren't true either. <laughs> Good man. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, another case that uh, certainly has uh, 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 rebel relevance here in, in New England, Massachusetts, the Boston Strangler case. Now, this was another case that you were thrust into the spotlight with, one of the biggest cases, murder cases in American history. Um, as, as Ken uh, and David pointed out, I've got a personal connection to this case. My aunt, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, was the youngest and final victim in that notorious 1960s murder spree. From 1962 to 1964, 11 women were strangled in the greater Boston area in a kill zone that stretched from Columbia Road in Dorchester, 40 miles north to Lawrence. The victims were young, they were old, they were black, they were white. There were, how many uh, suspects were they looking at at one point, Lee? Oh, everybody that could breathe, they were desperate. They were desperate. Yeah. And a year goes by after the last strangling, unfortunately, of my aunt, and a handyman from Chelsea, Massachusetts, who was incarcerated at the time with a, a, another um, a former client of yours, uh, George Nasser, decided to get in touch with you because he had a story to tell. Talk a little bit about that. Um, I was told by my then client who was charged with murder one that there was a guy in Bridgewater with him, mental institution, and he wanted to tell a big story to someone, and he'd asked for an introduction, so I went down to see him. And I didn't know much about the details of the 12 and a half, not 11, Stranglings. One woman was 88. We think she died of a heart attack. She died of a heart attack. The yeah. other woman was stabbed. That's right. But um, <clears throat> I listened to him and I said, whoa. I went to my friends at Boston Homicide. They said, give me some questions to which only the perpetrator would know the answer. Innocuous things found at the scene that nobody could read and remember or be briefed on and make up. They did. I went back. I tape recorded the answers. I went back and told them what I had been told. It was Saturday evening. When this happened, they called the police commissioner away from a party. Is that and McNamara at the time? Like? McNamara and John Donovan, the head of homicide, said, Commissioner, this is as close as we've ever come. And so we made a deal which has left the public, understandably, like the Magi of old, all unsatisfied. He was never convicted of anything. He was never charged with any of the strangling. He was charged with other crime, never charged with the strangler because everything he told them was under immunity, and that's the only way I could let them get at it. On the other hand, I never really got uh, pushed around or hated or otherwise held with disdain in that case, um, which is surprising because it was ugly. Me Life 4 was uglier. And what kind of guy was uh, Albert DeSalvo? You met with him several times. Yeah, lunch other, you probably invite him to dinner at your home. He seemed gentle. He was very polite. If somebody swore in a woman's presence, he would threaten them. He was in great physical shape. We got pretty close to the truth with him by putting him under hypnosis. Um, and he almost killed the hypnotist. So there was something in there no one ever understood and Albert didn't understand it. He wanted me to help him write a book to support his family, because he knew he was not gonna get out. Patty Hearst, another biggie for you. A nightmare. <laughs> it was an awful case. We defended a girl for one bank robbery where people got shot, who had participated in another bank robbery where a mother and her fetus were murdered with a shotgun. Um, that's what we were hired to get her out of and did. She had been in Los Angeles with a submachine gun that shot into a crowd and probably had blown up 22 police cars. So 
and Ken worked with me on this. It's part of where he came of age, I think. Um, everywhere you stepped, you were walking on eggs, and you had to be awfully careful not to break one. Then the judge changed the ruling in midstream, but tubed the case. But frankly, if we had lost that one, we were going to lose several down the line. So it was the time of damage control. Um, I still think she was brainwashed, but um, I still get the blame for losing the case, for putting her on the witness stand. So uh, life is not always a bowl of cherries, but as I said, if you walk into the kitchen, you know they don't make cool there, they make heat. What type of person was Patty Hurst when you met her? The seventh, one of seven children, unremarkable, not a disciplinary problem, not a shining star. She was actually kidnapped by mistake. They wanted her younger sister because they thought the father would pay more for her. Oh, wow. There's another uh, uh, former client that you and I have a shared experience with, uh, Joe the Animal Barboza, who oh. was one of the most notorious hitmen in New England history. And how did you get in, uh, involved with, uh, with him? He hired me for a case where he was accused of carrying a weapon. He was a felon. Um, I got him acquitted on everything but a misdemeanor. The judge, who could see what kind of guy was in front of him, immediately gave him the max. He then went on to get involved as a paid hitman. I think the number was 23. Right up there was Stevie Flemmy, Whitey Bulger's partner, and another fellow in New York that Kenny and I represented on him. This guy didn't shoot people, he moved the bodies after they were buried, so uh, the guys who ratted out couldn't give the cops anything to work with. Um, I uh, do not as yet have much of an understanding of those people. I do know that when Barbosa got gunned down on the streets of San Francisco, I was trying the Hearst case and the thought, cops thought he was coming for me because I had turned him in. What did you say to the press about uh, the death of Joe Barboza? Um, I didn't say anything to him because he was trying to hire me to defend him. Well, when Joe Barboza was killed, you said, you know, the nation will not mourn a guy like Joe Barboza. I, I said a lot worse than that, but yeah. that's what they printed. <laughs> But that was the culmination of, a, of, a, of a, a gangland murder spree in Boston where 53 to 57 mil, men were killed in a three and a half year period. Now that type of body count hasn't happened in Al Capone, Chicago. That never happened in, uh, in New York. That happened in Boston. And um, you, know, you were involved in that on the legal side. Um, it was interesting that uh, you know, Barboza later testified in three trials where he put innocent men behind bars. And those men spent two men. Two got the chair. Yep. Two did over 30 years. The FBI engineered a frame, and they've paid $121 million for that. The largest settlement against the US Justice Department in history. Oh, yes, by far. How was your relationship with the FBI and law enforcement at the time? Was it a, a strong relationship? Obviously, there were battles that you had to fight uh, on behalf of your clients. Talk a little bit about that. I think I was viewed as a constant thorn in their side. It made their cases more difficult or uh, sometimes took them away from them. But most of them, when they got in trouble, would call my number. Mm -hmm. That is a great segue to uh, this. Uh, Case about a glove, which um, if you folks don't know, uh, uh, Mr. Bailey here has just written a new book uh, that will be published very soon, and the title is The Case uh, About a Glove, and uh, Mr. Bailey will be signing copies of that book after our conversation uh, this evening. Um, how did you get involved with O.J. Simpson? I got a phone call from a lawyer I knew named Robert Shapiro who was trying to give him a polygraph test, something you can't do under these circumstances unless you wait a little while. Uh, it's no way to get a valid result. The examiner told him that. He said, test him. They're going to arrest him tomorrow. I don't want to do it in prison. The charts were wild. 
and Bob called me to see what he should do next. I said, get your client out of there, stop the tests. He didn't think to call me before. And uh, from then on, PR went the wrong way. I eventually got well, called in to prepare the case. You describe this case in your book as a front page case for your friend Shapiro. Is that why you got involved? Initially, I got involved to get him a place in the sun. He never tried a murder case, and suddenly he had the uh, mother of all mothers on his hands and in his lap. And he assured you that the case would be over quickly, right? No, he is the one that thought that we could attack the police for racism. Oh. And sure enough, we did. You know, talk about the night that O.J. Simpson was accused of killing Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman at 10.35 p.m. June 12, 1994 in Brentwood, California. Do you think he did it? I'm certain, as I am, that we are both sitting here that he didn't and couldn't have. And I am up to my neck with resentment for the way America and its court system handled this case. It was a circus, it was a disgrace, and I've never seen an innocent man treated worse in my life. And one of the things I think you point out uh, pretty clearly in your book is, is the timeline. The timeline of the night of the murder, I learned certainly a lot of new information uh, reading your book. Can you, can you take us through, you know, from 1015 p.m. that night yes. to 1055 p.m., 40 minutes where Simpson would have had to commit that crime? 20 minutes. 20, I'm sorry, 20 minutes. I was told there'd be no math here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, the murder was at 1035. He was in a limo for the airport before 11. Right. So, uh, Nicole Brown, his not a strange wife, but former wife, had two lovely kids by him. She and her mother were having dinner at a nearby restaurant called Mezzaluna. They finished, they left, went home, Mama forgot her glasses. They called back and an unfortunate um, young man named Ron Goldman volunteered to bring them down to her when he got off work. At 10 o'clock that night, Nicole was seen on the sidewalk arguing heatedly with some men in a white Ford pickup. The fellow who saw it never got to take the witness stand. He was so concerned he took his dog and turned away from the scene. At 10.25, a couple on their first date walked right by her front gate, nothing out of place, no blood in the street, no dogs, no violence. At about 10.32, her fellow out walking his dog, this was dog night, uh, including the barking that sounded the crime. And he heard someone yell, hey, hey, hey. It wasn't Simpson. It was Ron Goldman. Coming through the gates, a couple of assassins, we believe, were looking for a woman named Faye Resnick, who had lived there until two days before. She was then institutionalized for cocaine. She owed big bucks. Uh, the Colombians can't take you to court if you don't pay. But if you're a real deadbeat, they'll make an example of you. She had a Colombian necklace cut almost through, oh, was dead before she hit the ground. Goldman fought like a hero in 17 stab wounds, and he went out. At the restaurant with him that night was a young gal named Rachel Berman, a friend of the daughter. And she had planned to stay that night at the house O.J. called his daughter before he went to the airplane to uh, commend her for a recital she'd given that afternoon. And he was told Rachel was here and she'll be here overnight. So if he thereafter decided to go down and kill the mother of his two children, in plain sight, in a brutal and senseless way, he had every reason to believe there would be three witnesses looking out the window with a clear view. His son, his daughter, and Rachel Berman. The jury decided within an hour that he never had time. That's how the case ended. 
we could have gone on and on with that defense, but there was no need. What we failed to do is what you must do for a celebrity. You must establish their innocence. A reasonable doubt is not enough for the public. And he has labored under that shortcoming in our society for a quarter of a century, and I've taken a few lumps myself, and I don't like it. Well, you, one of the uh, first detectives that were made it to the scene that night was, was Mark Furman. And you were immediately suspicious of Furman, really before anybody else on the defense team was. Uh, talk a little bit about why you felt that uh, suspicion on, around that police detective. Um, I came to Los Angeles for the preliminary hearing where he testified. And he was, it is to this day, the only link between Simpson and the crime scene. And that's because one of the bloody gloves worn by somebody was found at his home in an unlikely place by Mark Furman, he claimed. I was not allowed to the courtroom because Shapiro did not want any of the sunshine deflected, and I agreed. I watched it on TV. When Furman was on the stand, I told the bailiff, get Shapiro out here. This guy has got to be taken down now. He's lying in his teeth. He made this up. Instead, Bob assigned a very nice fellow who was a law school dean, uh, hard of hearing and not a skilled cross-examiner, and Furman walked all over him. And then the fight was on, and we wasted an awful lot of public money, uh, misattention, and were covered generally with some very shining exceptions by a press that couldn't find his backside with both hands. They really didn't know what they were doing or what they were talking about. And the more naive and incompetent they were, like some people that have chided me since, the more sure they were. I do not have time in my life to listen to anyone who doesn't do his homework you believe that, that Furman took the bloody glove from the crime scene and then planted it at the, at the Brentwood estate that O.J. He wanted leaving. to stay in the case case. He had just been booted off the mm -hmm. case in favor of senior men. Uh, if he had a conscience, no one's ever had a look at it. He picked up the glove, not to frame Simpson, to become an essential witness and stay in the case. He put it in a Ziploc bag. Oh, experiments showed without question that night it would have dried in two hours and caked. When he discovered the glove, it was still wet. It was in the Ziploc bag until he told the others about it and led them out to an alley beside O.J.'s house and pointed it out to him. And that's the only thing that got this case off the ground and into the jury box. And the jury who'd been insulted called racist, stupid, and a few other things, uh, went right away for the thing that stood out most. O.J. never had time in 20 minutes to do these killings, hide the glove, uh, I'm sorry, hide the clothing, hide the knife, clean himself up. He's covered with blood if he did it, and get in that limousine. And nobody likes to hear that, because the more they look at what I say, the more impossible their suspicions are to even harbor, let alone voice. Discuss O.J.'s demeanor when he arrived in Chicago for that celebrity golf tournament the night of the murders. He was jovial. He was O.J., he was a, a, a very pleasant man. Uh, he talked with the captain and some friends on the airplane, talked to the limo driver, and they brought him in. He got the news that his wife had been murdered. They didn't tell him anything about it. He went right back to the airport, shaking like a leaf. You talk a lot about in your book the psychological evaluation of O.J. Talk a little bit about, about him, the, the O.J. that you got to know. I had him examined by the best murder psychiatrist in the history of the country from Massachusetts. He examined 500 people that have just killed someone. He's barely still alive in Florida. His name is Bernie Udowitz. He sat with O.J. for several hours and called me up. He said, why did they get this guy in here? He didn't kill anyone. 
We remember the 1989 domestic uh, abuse allegation. We saw the pictures of, of, a, of a bruised Nicole Simpson. And you don't think O.J. Simpson was, was capable of killing her? No, they got in a fight, and she got the worst of it, but she was a <laughs> tough little gal. The head of the Women's Battered Union Support Group was going to testify had we gotten all our witnesses to the stand, just like the fellow who probably saw the killers that night. And she would have said, this man is not a batterer. You don't think, again, he could have reverted back? Obviously, there were photographs of Simpson from the 1989 uh, incident where uh, you know, she was a, a battered woman. I think there are people that, you she know. bruised. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think that for a minute, indeed. It's a pretty flimsy shred, but it was enough for a press that decided this case when they saw him in the low-speed chase, which looked like maybe he's trying to get away. What did you think when that was all going down? I watched it. Uh, I thought he's ruining his case, whatever he's got, and then I found out where he'd gone, to the cemetery. And that's the biggest oxymoron in the English language, a low-speed chase. Oh. It was an escort. One of the things I thought was most fascinating about your book, Lee, describe the delicate balance within O.J. Simpson's defense team, especially the relationship between you, Shapiro, and Johnny Cochran. The dream team was a nightmare team <coughs> with some very good people, Johnny Cochran, it was one of the best friends I ever had. I'm sorry to lose him. We got along just like that. It was a mixed bag. Um, there was a lot of infighting in there. When I nailed Furman with the tapes, quite unexpectedly, they took me off his cross-examination and gave it to Dean Ullman just to make up for the criticism he'd taken at the preliminary hearing, knowing full well that all Furman was going to say, I take the fifth. How involved was O.J. in his own defense? Very much so, and pretty astute. I used to get down to see him if I was in court that day before everybody, because I'm the only one that got there on time. And I'd sit in the cell and talk with him, and he had his own ideas about who should do what, to whom, and how it should be done. He's a very quick learner. O.J. is a bright, bright man. Did he equate uh, legal terms to football terms? I read about that in your book. The day we fired Bob Shapiro and he threatened to quit and make a public statement, O.J. was quick to pick up the fact he wasn't kidding. He said, okay, Bob, you can be the quarterback. But this is a single wing formation. That's the old football formation where the quarterback never got the ball. And he said, if you do get it, Bob, no passing. <laughs> And so, as close as we come to benching him without having him tear us apart, and I'm sure the public and the press would have gobbled it up like Joe Burrell eats spaghetti. How did O.J. Uh, behave during the trial? O.J.? Even killed, or was it, were there ups, or were there downs? The only time he really saw him emote was when the verdict came in. I was standing right next to him. That picture traveled around the world more than any single image in the history of the world. 9-11 beat it eventually, but that was reruns. And uh, the world reacted. Black people were very happy. A lot of white people who thought they knew better than the jury were not, and they still chew me out till today for prostituting my talents for getting the end guy off. And as I said before, I don't like it. So be prepared or this snake can bite. <laughs> I'd like to have you talk a little bit about some of the key different players that we all saw on television during the O.J. Simpson case. So I will say a name and you just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Somebody like Marsha Clark, for example. The do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't like to be harsh or sound like a sore loser, particularly since we're the winner. 
She was not a good lawyer. She's had no career since that time. She was hell on wheels in the courtroom. Uh, it was not at all a pleasant experience. What about Chris Darden? Chris Darden was a nice guy who got shoved in at the last minute because it turned out that the jury was majority black and he suddenly joined the team. I don't think anybody liked that. Chris was having a wonderful time until I tricked him into him asking OJ to try on the glove, and then not so much. Um, again, these people did not have the footwork, the quickness of wit, or the command of the language that it takes to cross-examine a witness. And so most of what you saw wasn't even good Hollywood. Now, you mentioned the glove, obviously. Was that uh, a strategy that was debated at all within the OJ defense team? getting O.J. to try on that glove? Um, now, Johnny's book suggests we talked about it. We hadn't. And I tell you, the reason for that is I never saw the glove as the case is being prepared. When it was put on the defense table while the manufacturer was testifying, I realized that my hands are perfect size nine, or some would say a D cup. But the glove was going to be really, really tight on me. And OJ's got hands so big he never fumbled the football. He just wrapped it. So I tried it on, confirmed my suspicions, and I walked up to Darden. You can see as I can, that glove won't fit Simpson. And if you don't ask him to try it on, I will. It wasn't even my witness. It was a bluff. And he took the bait. The rest is history. I'd like to get your opinion on one case that I've been involved in. Tom Brady, the flake gate, guilty or innocent? I, I was upset so much by that case. It was apparent to me from the outset that the commissioner of football was taking a revenge on the punching he took for not punishing a black running back from Baltimore for beating his wife up in an elevator. And deflate gate is a total sham. As one judge pointed out, no one has made any showing as to why in the world you'd want to change the pressure in the ball. Quarterbacks like to for different reasons. Did it fly any better? No. I think the whole thing was made up, and the two guys that have forever held their peace, I'd love to hear their story. I think Tom Brady got shafted. Me too. The great F. Lee Bailey, everybody. I'd like to bring up the two owners of Willow Bend, Mr. David Southworth, Mr. D Joe Deitch. They've got a, a special presentation for you, Lee. It is with great pleasure that we uh, present this plaque. Uh, it says all these glowing things about you. It just says you about you being a pioneer, our friend, what it means to Willow Bend, and how special this day is. So this plaque will uh, be uh, installed in the uh, honorary courtyard and will be there longer than all of us. So thank you. You know, for a guy approaching middle age with a <laughs> modicum of grace, my wealth is not found in bank accounts. It's found in the wonderful people that I get to know and they never go away. And David Southworth is certainly in that group with Ken and Joe and Amalia and Debbie. Uh, I am a very fortunate man. And every now and then, it's good exercise to kick ass and take names. <laughs> Thank you. All right.